Welcome to our discussion on feminism. Today we're going to be talking about indigenous feminism. And to help us get started, I want us to think about some of the arguments that were made uh, in our last lecture on third wave feminism. And if you remember, one of the kind of defining characteristics of third wave feminism was its inclusive nature. It was wanting to make sure that not just uh, white upper class uh, women were getting a, a seat at the table in the conversation about equality, but it was pushing uh, for, for everyone to have a seat at the table. And so one of the first questions that uh, someone may think about um, in, in thinking about indigenous feminism is uh, why is it different than, say, third wave feminism? Uh, what's the, the nature of it um, that makes it its own brand? Uh, of feminism. And really, in, in thinking critically about um, all of the different waves of feminism that we've talked about and uh, what we'll say in, in the future about feminism, I think that's a, actually a very good starting point um, it, uh, for, for any discussion, is, is really to think about what, what is the defining characteristic uh, that separates it from almost anything else. If you take a look at these pictures really quick, you can get an idea um, of the kind of multitude of, of different ways in which uh, indigenous feminism uh, presents itself and some of the arguments uh, that we're going to take a look at really quickly here. Um, if you look at that, the third kind of picture uh, here, the one that, that um, kind of has cropped out, uh, no wave feminism, I, I think that's actually a, a very interesting approach in, in thinking about feminism um, is, again, um, going back to this idea and notion about waves of feminism, if that's really an appropriate way to, to describe feminism, um, or if there's some kind of characteristic about it um, that would be better served by, by staying away from, from the description of it uh, through different waves. And so we're going to take a look um, today not only at the separation um, of indigenous feminism from third wave feminism, um, but we're, we're going to take a look at it in its own right and its own capacity um, and its own arguments. To help us get started with that project, I think it's beneficial to go ahead and take a look at the author of today's text, Paula Gunn Allen. As you can see, she lived from 1939 to 2008. So she's one of the more recent authors that we've taken uh, a look at, one of the more recent uh, philosophers. And uh, there's a number of different things about Paula Gunn Allen that I think are absolutely interesting uh, to start with uh, the fact that for, for most of her life, she rejected um, most of the labels that were assigned to her. Um, she's part of uh, what's known as the um, Native American Renaissance um, in the United States. And um, she rejects this, this label. Um, she, she's one of the first people to point out that Native American um, conceptions of sexuality uh, don't really match up neatly uh, with um, notions of sexuality that Western culture uh, has. And um, one of the kind of key ideas that she has uh, through, throughout her writing um, is to continuously show uh, the, the differences in thinking between Native American Indian traditions and uh, Western ideals. In, in one of her books, uh, Spider Woman's Granddaughters, um, at, at the beginning of it, uh, the preface, um, she actually talks about um, how Aristotle's uh, thinking in a lot of ways um, thwarts, um, especially Aristotle's notion of like uh, classifications of like kingdoms and, and, and things that we use even in biology today. Um, she, she talks about how this more or less kind of thwarts um, this, this open ideal that's present um, in Native American traditions. Um, and uh, you know, what we tend to think of more as this kind of like spectrum of, of thought now, um, she, she really is one of the starting, I, uh, um, thinkers, philosophers behind that. And so aside from that, I think it's worth noting that she uh, had a very diverse background uh, herself. Um, her parents were, were um, both uh, Laguana Pueblo as well as uh, Lebanese, and um, she has a lot of like European uh, background to her as well. Um, obviously, the Laguana Pueblo 
uh, title is is the one um, that she identified with uh, the most. But she didn't cast off uh, the, the other uh, backgrounds that she had. And she she incorporated them uh, throughout her life. But being a, a pueblo was uh, the thing uh, again that she identified with the most. And if you take a look at these pictures um, up here at the top, there are different pictures of her. Um, the one on the far left is uh, a picture of her teaching, and the one on the far right um, is probably the, the most famous picture of her, although it was taken uh, fairly late. Um, I, I think um, aside from all the things that I just said about her, uh, it would it would be bad of me not to mention um, that right before she died, uh, she published a, a book um, about Pocahontas, um, and um, she was uh, nominated for the Pulitzer Prize of, for this book, um, and um, it, it's called Pocahontas Medicine Woman, Spy, Entrepreneur, Diplomat, um, and, it, and it gives them a very different kind of look at the life of Pocahontas um, than what we're used to in just the, the Disney kind of like version, and, and going back to the point I was making in um, one of our first talks uh, about feminism, uh, it uncovers uh, some of those ideas that, that we've attached ourselves to in, in Western culture um, and, and thinking about the role of, of women uh, in society. And so on, on, as a whole, um, the, the author that we have for today, I, I think, is a very interesting person. Um, and in connection with that, I, I want to go ahead and show uh, where this essay that we had uh, falls. Um, so it's, it's part of the uh, larger book known as The Sacred Hoop, Recovering the Feminine in American Indian Traditions. Um, I want to show you just really quick here in the table of contents where uh, that, <laughs> uh, that selection is. If you look at the geography of this book, uh, you can see it's broken down into basically three different parts. Um, the first section is what's called the way of our grandmothers. Um, the second section is the word warriors, and the final one is pushing up the sky. Um, and each of these are specific references um, towards Native American cultures um, that she wants to uh, bring uh, awareness to. Um, but what I think is really interesting is the section that we had today, uh, where I come from, is like this. If you can see, I'm going to mark it up here uh, real quick just so you can see where it lies. Um, it's kind of a microcosm of um, the other things that she's writing about because she, she tries to integrate um, in this one chapter um, uh, uh, several of, of the other arguments that you see along the way. Um, if you look at those uh, first two chapters there, um, th those are really an introduction into um, the kind of history uh, behind what she's talking about and where I come from uh, is like this. And uh, the word warriors really gives a good sense. Uh, sorry, I just marked that up. Um, but uh, it gives a really good sense for kind of like the oral tradition that we're going to talk a little bit more uh, about. And then um, pushing up the sky itself um, is, is an interesting part uh, of the book. Um, I don't really think we have a good amount of time to kind of hit on all the nuance um, that, that's in it. Um, but I want to draw your attention really quick to uh, the, the chapter that begins on 209, um, Who is Your Mother? The Red Roots of White Feminism. And I think um, that if you were to only be able to read one more chapter out of this, um, I, I think that that one uh, is, is very interesting in terms of what we've talked about so far about feminism, because it makes uh, an argument that I don't think you really will find in, in almost any other author um, about uh, the suffrage movement itself and what we've talked about as kind of this first wave uh, movement. And it, it makes a very compelling argument there. Um, there's also, if, if you're interested in, um, you know, uh, stays on sexuality, um, I think this chapter uh, right here is is a very interesting take on that. Um, uh, you didn't really, in this uh, part where I come from is like this, um, didn't really get a, a very good sense of, of how she talks about sexuality. Um, but but obviously, uh, that that chapter is a is a good introduction. So if we can begin by looking at uh, the, the basic argument that Paula Gunn and Allen is making throughout this uh, whole essay, 
um, it really comes down to the separation that she sees um, of, of culture from Native Americans and Western culture. And in particular, um, the ideal of women in Western culture versus the ideal uh, of women in Native American literature. And so if you look at this writing that she has, uh, she starts off by saying, uh, you know, this, my, my ideas of womanhood passed on largely by my mother and grandmothers, Laguana Pueblo women, are about practicality, strength, reasonableness, intelligence, wit, and competence. I also vi remember vividly the women who came to my father's store, the women who held me and sang to me, the women at feast day, at grab days, the women in the kitchen of my Cobero home, the women I grew up with, none of them appeared weak or helpless, none of them presented herself tentatively. Um, I want to point out that um, she's not making an argument here that says all Western women are weak in some way or another. Um, and I, I know plenty of students who sometimes uh, take that as, as the lesson here. Um, instead, she is describing the, the strength of Native American women. And in particular, um, in, in this passage, she's drawing back uh, to her own childhood um, and her memories of, of what women are like. Uh, if, you, if you look at this image for a moment uh, here, this is um, a medallion um, that you can actually see in, in one of the other pictures, um, that the last slide that we had um, of, of Polygon Allen. Um, and this medallion, medallion um, actually shows uh, the picture of Grandmother Spider, who is considered um, in um, not just Pueblo uh, traditions, but um, several other Native American traditions, mostly in the kind of Mesoamerica um, like region. Um, Grandmother Spider is considered to be this this wise, intelligent, um, cunning sometimes, but um, mostly creative uh, um, goddess. And um, you, you see in, in different ways um, how Grandmother Spider um, sews together the, the, the universe and, and weaves together um, different forms of, of thought. And so sometimes when Polygon Allen is referred uh, to, she, she's referred to it as Thought Woman, um, which um, again is, is a honorific kind of deification uh, title. Um, um, but in, in thinking about that, it's really a, a reference towards um, this image of, of Grandmother Spider, um, who with her mind, um, not with her, her strength, but with her mind, um, is able to weave together uh, the universe. And so looking at that, it's a major contrast to any conceptions that we can think about um, in Western culture. There's not very many um, deities that exist in Western culture that, that are women um, and that are known primarily for um, their deep thinking abilities. Um, even if you look at a, a deity like Athena, for instance, um, you know, she's born um, when Zeus has a major headache and splits himself, you know, splits his head open and, and she pops out. Um, and, um, you know, Athena is known for lots of different things. Um, if we go back to our, our Greek chapter, you know, Athens is named um, after her in, in a rather brutal fashion. If you ever look at the actual story um, behind the naming of, of Athens, there's a, a cloth that's thrown down the earth that's um, not the the best kind of like arrangement and um, uh, Athens springs forth from that that cloth I'll let you take a look at the legend if you're interested um, but uh, in Western culture there, there just really isn't this idea of, of a deity that's a woman that's known for her thinking capabilities um, and that obviously has major implications as we move forward in thinking about Native American traditions themselves. I also want to draw attention to this middle part of the passage that I've, I've got underlined. Um, and you may be reading that and looking at, you know, I, I know what a store is, right? I can, I can guess about that. Um, I can guess what feast day is. Um, but as you look at that uh, phrase grab days, um, you may say to yourself, like, I, I have no idea what a grab day is. Um, um, is um, and um, again, she's she's contextualizing this um, in her own life. And so, actually, I want to talk about the tradition of grab days um, in uh, the Pueblo tradition um, because it's a significant part of her life as well.
So grab days are a special holiday um, that, that is celebrated um, in the Laguna Pueblo tribe. And really it's interesting because a, a lot of the year um, kind of rotates around this one particular um, uh, tradition. Um, I've seen uh, other places that list this as a 300 or a 400 year old uh, tradition and the main idea behind this is if you look at like Pueblo tribes um, they have these these houses like you see in the bottom left hand uh, corner where you uh, you know take a ladder to get up uh, on top of the roof and, and the roof is really supposed to be mint uh, for something. And what you do is basically uh, you take the things from your household that you no longer um, use, um, things that just for whatever reason um, are, are no longer useful towards you. And um, people take turns throwing the stuff that they have uh, to the crowds of people waiting below. There's a Sundance uh, film uh, called Grab that um, documents this tradition and kind of is, is a larger uh, discussion about um, the uh, commercialization of this event um, and you can kind of see this trajectory where um, in, the people who, who knew about this tradition in, in kind of the older days um, slowly uh, start giving way to, to people who are doing things like buying boxes of like macaroni and cheese um, and uh, you know various other things but uh, it, regardless of whether or not it's become commercialized um, there's still a lot of people who will spend um, a, a decent amount of, of the year preparing for, for grab day and doing things like making uh, their own pottery and, and growing vegetables in their own gardens um, and baking special um, bread um, and just doing all, all kinds of, of, of things to throw uh, out uh, at, at grab day. Um, and the purpose behind this is really, again, to, to take the, the things that are no longer useful for some people and share them uh, with people who could uh, use those those items better. And so that's what Grab Day is that she's referring to in the text. I mentioned that tradition because, again, I think it's useful to, to look at um, the overarching argument that she's uh, referring to in this text. Um, and again, that, that is the idea that Native American traditions are significantly different uh, than Western traditions. And because of that, Native American conceptions of women um, are different than Western conceptions of women. And so if we look at the goals of feminism in each kind of wave that we've talked about um, in the Western tradition, um, it conceives of women as um, again, looking at Simone de Beauvoir, um, the, the other, the, the dependent consciousness um, to man's independent consciousness, um, or <coughs> to use the terminology, um, again, that, that's helpful here, the, the oblique to the absolute. Um, but Polygon Allen doesn't see um, women being portrayed in um, uh, Native American culture the same way. And uh, for her, the, the main idea is not to try and assert um, independence, is not to try and assert um, a more dominant view, but instead it's to reclaim uh, what used to be the conception of women. Um, it's to, to speak out against um, the Western ideal of women and, and to go back and reclaim the view that um, is dominant in Native American culture. And so she lists all these different women, and I have a, a list of, of five here that are significant figures, um, but she lists all these different women in Native American literature and culture um, that have dominant sorts of roles. And um, I think if you go through this whole list, you, you'll find all kinds of interesting stories, but I wanna point out um, two of them that I think are extremely interesting. Uh, the first one is the story of White Buffalo Woman. And you may have noticed that when she mentions this, she, she means that uh, <laughs> she, she puts this in connection with bringing the uh, 
the uh, ritual of the sacred pipe. Um, and that's exactly what it sounds like. Um, right. Uh, White Buffalo Woman is, is considered to be uh, this uh, mystical figure who taught um, the, these uh, rituals um, to, to different tribes. And um, of course, one of those ritualistic uh, um, uh, engagements or ceremonies is, is the smoking of the, of the peace pipe. Um, but I actually, I, I want to talk about um, right before uh, that event occurs, um, how it is that she comes to bring the, the ritual of the sacred pipe to, to people. Um, and uh, the stories are almost always told where two men are walking in a field and they see this beautiful uh, woman. And one of them decides that he's going uh, to caress her and, and do whatever he wants. Um, to this beautiful woman and so he approaches her and he he gets a sense that she is uh, in some ways divine and it doesn't matter to him whatsoever um, and he goes to caress her um, and suddenly uh, clouds um, uh, envelop him in some uh, myths um, lightning bolts shoot out um, from white buffalo women um, but regardless um, every story always ends with him being fully destroyed um, by <laughs> the white buffalo woman and she goes and looks at the other guy um, who is walking uh, with, with this uh, person um, and sensing that he has a true and better heart uh, tells him to go prepare uh, for her because she will come to the tribe and, and teach them the ways of peace. And um, in thinking about this, I, I wonder if you can think of, of a corollary example in Western culture where, again, um, a divinity that is clearly a woman um, destroys a man who is lusting after her um, and then um, asks another man to go in and prepare um, for her because she's going to bring uh, peace to, to their tribe. Um, and it, it's such a different perspective um, than, than almost any other kind of religious view that we we could think of um, in in Western culture um, the second one here um, to Knotson, I think is also an interesting kind of story because it actually circles back um, to uh, another sort of myth um, and in fact if you look this this story up uh, you, you could well spend um, right a, a large section of your life trying to look at all the different kind of um, stories that, that go uh, with the story of Tanatsin um, most people, when, when they grow up in Mexico, um, will hear the story about Guadalupe. Um, and in thinking about that, m m most people think that the story of Guadalupe is really just, um, you know, the Hispanic version of uh, the Madonna or, um, you know, Mary in some ways. Um, but actually, um, Guadalupe is the emergence um, of the story of Tanatsin with um, and again, if you look at the text, uh, what Paula Gunn Allen says is the, the, the walk of Juan Diego. Um, and that is entirely where we get the, the city of San Diego's name. Um, but Juan Diego, um, one thing that all scholars agree on about his existence um, is that he was born as a Native American um, and that he did spend a, a good amount of his life um, as um, this kind of missionary. And so the, the main story that's told about Guadalupe in Mexico um, is a story about Juan Diego. And there's different variations and different versions um, of the connection of Tenatzin with um, Juan Diego's walk um, and um, whether or not Juan Diego sees Tenatzin or whether or not Juan Diego sees uh, the, the Virgin Mary in Guadalupe. Um, is one of history's most fascinating sorts of details. Uh, we know that the Catholic Church, um, after this vision of Guadalupe, um, you know, starts to, to gain a lot of prominence um, with uh, Native Americans. And um, in, in general, we, we see this kind of uh, mixture between these two different cultures. I want to show you on this next slide just how prominent that is. But before I do, um, I want you to also look at these other three kind of motifs um, that um, circle around in uh, different Native American traditions. A uh, yellow woman is a very prominent story, um, not so much in Mesoamerican uh, literature, but definitely in, in the Plains Indian culture um, and even uh, the culture that, that's close to ours, uh, Mississippi mud culture. Um, it, it, uh, 
uh, is a, a story about this kind of uh, seductress and um, leading this kind of double identity and uh, how, how um, is it possible for, for women of power um, to, to gain uh, an identity um, beyond um, just sed seducing people, but, but to have their own, uh, their own kind of view of identity um, <laughs> aside from sexuality. Uh, Grandmother Spider, we've already talked about a little bit. Um, and the Yataku um, is known by several different names in, in all kinds of different Native American cultures. Um, but the, the central idea behind the Yataku is the uh, idea of the, the corn maize goddess. And um, if you look at some of the early Native American creation stories, um, one of the running strands in those stories is this idea um, that human beings are actually created from corn um, and that um, from husk are you started and from husk do you end. Um, but um, Yataku is one of um, the, the more famous kind of figures um, in that um, she begins both the cycle of life and death um, in the underground um, where corn is harvested and um, where it springs forward. Um, and again, she, she is considered to be uh, kind of a, a creator of, of all mankind, of all humanity, um, in the sense that she brings corn and life um, to everyone. And so, again, I, I don't want to um, look too long on, on those traditions, but they are very different um, than a lot of the religious traditions that we see in the West. Just to drive the point home before... Uh, we start looking at some of the more philosophical um, ideas of, of this text. I, I want to point out the fact that um, there are these kind of emergences that we see, especially in Mesoamerican culture. Um, you know, C Cortez um, was well known for trying to manipulate um, yeah, Central American ideals um, about gods and goddesses. Um, there's a story that's told that, you know, he tried to be Quetzal, um and, um, you know, pre pretended um, to, to be different deities in order to, to trick uh, different Native American tribes throughout Central America and um, South America into thinking that he, he was a, a god. Um, but what I want to point out is, is aside from, from those kinds of little tricks that, that happened, um, th there's an even greater um, kind of assimilation of culture uh, from the, the Catholic Church, but beyond that, just uh, the governing bodies um, of European colonists um, to try and merge together uh, different gods and goddesses um, with um, uh, of Native American cultures with Christian beliefs. And Guadalupe, like I said, is probably the best example of that. Um, but if you look over here on the far left um, and over on the far right, you can see kind of these contrasting images um, in, in each culture. And um, if you remember, Polygon Allen talks about that um, there are all these kind of passive figures in Western culture of, of Madonna, um, of uh, you know, Mary, um, you know, looking up towards God, holding Jesus, the baby. Um, there's this whole fascination in Victorian paintings of just trying to show all the different forms of motherhood um, with uh, Mary. And as we've talked about before, even, you know, very contemporary history books still more or less assign the role of Western women um, to being these kind of sideshow assortments um, towards the actions that men undertake. Um, and if you contrast that with the images that you see over here on the right um, of uh, Native American figures, you, you can understand that there is clearly a difference, um, especially um, in the emphasis that Paula Gunn Allen puts um, about the role of women in Native American uh, traditions. And so the center here um, is some of those paintings that emerge that try to really combine together these features um, so that you have, um, you know, the, kind of the darker complexion and, um, you know, some of the sim same features um, of the uh, uh, Mesoamerican cultures, um, but still integrating the Christian Christian tradition um, and ultimately trying to co-opt these ideas into a, a single uh, <laughs> national uh, discussion or, or national uh, literature. 
I think it's important to mention um, this co-option of uh, the religious beliefs of Native Americans um, into a, a Christian uh, sort of view, because when we take a look at um, all the different genocide that happened against Native Americans, and Polygon Allen uh, that doesn't mention it in, in this essay, but in uh, other writings that she's had, um, she she estimates that somewhere between 20 and 40 million, um, uh, again, 20 to 40 million uh, Native Americans um, ultimately were killed through uh, disease, through warfare, um, you know, through genocide. And all that genocide didn't happen ju just through warfare, um, but it's um, obviously a big part of how she sees uh, culture interacting um, t to the time of her writing. And I would draw your attention back towards this time period um, that really began in the uh, late 1800s, um, you know, somewhere between about 1850 and 1870, um, all the way up through uh, 1970. Um, I, I think 1973 is when the last Native American boarding school uh, was closed. And really, a more accurate term for, for these schools is uh, Christian re-education camps. Um, because for, for the most part, what, what they did was to take um, Native American children away from their families, um, place them in these living arrangements. And as you can see on that picture on the right, um, within a, a very short amount of time, uh, they, they were um, completely groomed and changed um, to, to look um, this kind of Western part. In addition to that, the, the schools that they were sent to um, were really um, these kind of trade schools where they weren't given the same kind of education as their white counterparts. Um, and in a lot of ways, they, they were really sent to these schools to, to learn about discipline um, and to be integrated into American society, but only in so far as they would learn a, a trade and not really a profession. Um, the main point uh, of these schools was to um, as um, I will show you on the next slide, um, try and, and take away as much of the, their Native American Indian features um, as uh, possibly could. And so if you look at the bottom right here at the description of this picture, you know, it says uh, the, the three people's names, Wounded Yellow Robe, Henry Standing Bear, and Timber Yellow Robe, before and after their Pennsylvania boarding school gave them proper clothes and haircuts. And um, this happened um, for well over 100,000 uh, different children. Again, the, the dates are a little unclear about when these boarding schools exactly started um, because they were extensions of missionary programs. And um, the missionaries obviously started these schools um, earlier. Um, and then when they, when they became a little bit more official, um, when they um, had uh, different uh, people financing them, uh, that's when um, uh, different children were, were taken away from their parents, placed into these boarding schools, um, and for, for long stretches of time. So one of the mottos um, by which the, the Carlisle Indian School, um, which you can see that this individual Tom Torlino, um, a Navajo, um, was um, boarded in. Um, one of the mottos uh, of it was was kill the Indian and, and save the man. And so um, the, the purpose of these boarding schools um, was was very obvious from, from the beginning. Um, and as you can see in, in that picture, um, it says, right, as he entered the school in 1882, and as he appeared three years later. Um, so, uh, again, a, a large portion of this um, idea um, behind these these boarding schools, and even if you look at the, the name of the one on the left, right, Regina Indian Industrial School, um, was again to just change the kind of tradition by which uh, people were familiar, um, so that uh, they would instead be integrated into Western society um, under Western culture without any reference um, towards their own heritage, without any reference towards. Uh, their own culture. Looking at um, not just the massive genocide that happened um, to uh, Native Americans, and again, go going with the conservative estimates, it's about 20 million Native Americans um, that died, like at least that, that died. And I, of course, it doesn't 
just include like North America, but um, it, you know, to total all all Native Americans. Um, but but again, the the more liberal estimates have have that almost doubled. Um, and so looking at that, it's it's not just that genocide happened um, to to Native American cultures, um, but it's that these other forms of power that we've kind of like looked at, um, like these other types of normalization, start creeping their way into Native American life. And so um, you know, n not only does this genocide happen, but then we start taking children away from their parents, um, which is so important, and we'll, we'll talk about that as, as well. Um, and, you know, we start trying to educate them. If you look at that picture on the far right side, I mean, really think about what the lesson is that uh, is being taught in this classroom. Like, certainly they're writing words up on the board, right? But, like, look at what the, the words are about and look at the banner that's underneath them. And like, what, what is the real lesson that you're trying to teach uh, these children? And so uh, there's this phrase that's used in philosophy. And, um, you don't see it um, a, a whole lot of other places, um, usually like anthropology or human geography, um, sometimes in sociology. Um, but the, this phrase, um, it's um, uh, coined by a philosopher named Deleuze, and it's called deterritorialization. Um, and again, if you look at the definition here, it's the process of weakening ties between a culture and a location. Um, and this is exactly the point that Paula Gunn Allen is getting at, is that there is some way, some process um, by which uh, how Native American women have uh, been trained to think about themselves does not correspond to the tradition by which Native American women um, originally were, were ingratiated into. And so uh, I would point out that these Christian schools, um, which in a lot of ways thought that they were doing the right thing by, by taking these children away, separating them from their parents, trying to teach them a Western tradition, um, is, is exactly going back to what we've talked about with, with Karl Marx um, and with, with Foucault, um, is exactly the way that, that power operates in this dominating sort of like relationship um, where, um, again, these, these contradictions try to work themselves out um, ultimately um, by, by forcing people to, to alienate away from the, the things that are the most useful and the most valuable to them, and then instead trying to assign to them this kind of arbitrary uh, value of, of life that just doesn't really work uh, for, for a lot of people. And so where you see Polygon Allen talking um, about um, this uh, you know, deterritorialization uh, of life um, is, is really in these misconceptions that she has to figure out and these contradictions that she has to work out about what she's been told from these Christian missionaries um, and what she's experienced actually growing up as a Native American. And so there are several ways in which this deterritorialization happens to Native Americans. Uh, some of the most obvious cases um, are the actual removal of the people from the land that they're on. Um, if you look at some of the court cases that surround um, you know, uh, Native Americans. It's uh, very interesting. As soon as the Louisiana Purchase um, had uh, been uh, conducted by the United States, um, there was a, a treaty that, that was signed that said everything west of the Mississippi um, belonged to the Native Americans, was, was Indian territory. Um, and of course, that, that was later revoked. Um, probably the most famous case is this uh, one Worcester versus Georgia, um, where Justice uh, John Marshall had actually uh, mandated that the way that the United States dealt with um, other um, Indian territories, other Native American territories, um, was uh, by a sovereign nation to a sovereign nation. And uh, Andrew Jackson is, is famous for saying, um, you know, that uh, Marshall has enforced uh, his opinion, or sorry, Mar Marshall has made his opinion, now, now let him enforce it. Um, and of course, the, the Trail of Tears uh, followed after that. And so you have the actual removal of people from their lands and um, this continuous push um, towards, you know, what was known as manifest destiny, that the United States is inevitably going to own um, everything that's west of it. But then there's also 
um, aside from that, sh stripping people um, of their of their oral tradition, which is a very important part um, of Native American culture. And if you look at what Paula Gunn Allen says about oral tradition, she, she mentions all, all of these. I, I couldn't put them all on the slide, right? But if you just look at this list on the left hand side, she says, you know, all of these are stories that her mother told her. And she said you know, she didn't recognize them as stories necessarily at the time. But all, all of these are the types of stories uh, that her mother told her. And I think it's worth mentioning as well that um, aside from the, this rich kind of oral tradition, um, Native Americans, um, you know, particularly Plains Indians, um, have... Uh, had a, a tradition of, of sign language um, as well. And in fact, American sign language is, is mostly composed um, of uh, French sign language mixed with uh, Plains Indian sign language. In fact, the, the words that we get uh, for, for mother and father um, are, if you ever noticed, um, the <laughs> use of the, the feathers either at the, the top of the head for, for father or um, on, on the chin uh, for, for mother. And uh, that this comes directly from the Plains Indian Sign Language uh, that, that, that was used. And so um, there's ways in which uh, language transpired um, beyond just the, the oral language as well, but the oral language is, is very important, as, as you can see in this um, <laughs> none too exhaustive list um, of stories that, that she was told. And um, when she gets done going through this whole list um, of different things, and she, uh, I left out some of the most significant things on the list about like politics and religion and so on. Um, but she says, um, you know, all of these stories combined together were really these stories that, that taught her about the meaning of words that she said. And then um, you get this very interesting kind of metaphysical claim. She says that all life is a circle and everything has a place within it. Um, one of the other conceptions that we're, we're not going to really explore um, in this uh, area, but um, some people have, have sometimes equated um, the, um, the medicine wheel with um, the, the Taoist um, kind of notion of, of yin and yang rising and falling. And um, I, I think it's interesting um, how many different connections uh, there, are, there really are. Uh, is um, between uh, the yin and yang cycle and the, the medicine wheel in uh, Native American literature. So if this piques your interest, that's uh, another place that you could uh, look into. Um, but this con conception that all of life is a circle, and everything has a place within it, um, goes in several different directions in Native American philosophy. Um, one of the other interesting essays that she has is one titled, uh, The Woman I Love is a Planet, The Planet I Love is a Tree. And um, in it, she makes this really uh, interesting analysis where you know she talks about how, how many different types of creatures actually live on your body. Um, and, you know, for, for those creatures on your body, as microbes and so on and so forth, uh, that they, um, you know, don't realize that um, you view them the way that you do because they're just part of your body. Um, and, and she talks about how our, our planet, um, in a lot of ways, is are like those, we're, we're like those microbes on, on the planet that we live on. Um, and um, she, uh, you know, extends this analogy to, to a lot of different <laughs> ways in which um you know the the planet itself is, is like a body that um you know people should decide what they want to put in it and um should um you know uh, think about what, what what is pleasurable um and what, what is not pleasurable um and uh the second part of it where sh she talks about the planet is like a tree is she, she talks about the, the growth of trees and kind of this extended network um and when, when you think about it as a, this kind of cosmological um, uh, sort of principle, uh, what she's really getting at is this interrelatedness of life and how everything, how every story that's told um, affects someone else's story um, and how even the, the tiniest thing in the universe uh, still has significance and how even the greatest things in the universe still have significance. 
Uh, what I would like you to do for your in-class assignment uh, today is I want you to to take up part of this oral tradition that Paula Gunn Allen is talking about. Um, I want you to write a story on the discussion board. And again, because it is a discussion board, you're going to share it with everybody else. But I want you to write a story about your own life. Um, you don't have to, to get deep into the weeds or uh, tell us a lot of different uh, things, but just tell us one kind of family story uh, about your life on the discussion board. And you can decide how detailed you want to be from it. Um, and my hope is that you'll, you'll be able to look at not only your story, but other people's stories as well. Um, and maybe see some connections, maybe see some overlaps that, that, that are interesting points for you. And so one of the other ways that we see uh, this notion of deterritorialization work itself out um, is in how um, uh, Native Americans are um, led to believe the history of, of their own people. And so if you just look at uh, what she has in, in uh, this essay, right? She says, uh, no Indian can grow to any age without being informed that her people were savages who interfered with the march of progress um, pursued by respectable, loving, civilized white people. We are the villains of the scenario when we are mentioned at all. We are absent from much of white history, except when we are calmly, rationally, succinctly, and systematically dehumanized. On the few occasions we are noticed in any way other than as howling, bloodthirsty beings, we are claimed for our noble quaintness. In this definition, we are exotic curious. Our ancient arts and customs are used to draw tourist money to stake coffers into the pocketbooks and bank accounts of scholars and into support of the American and Disneyland promoter's dream. And um, as you can see here, uh, there's a couple of different depictions. So you know, I have two there where you see this idea of the savage, right? The bloodthirsty savage um, splitting people open and um, wanting to basically just bleed them out. Um, and then you have the, the idea of the, the noble savage um, as well. And if, if you Google that, you'll get... Um, all kinds of, of hits, all kinds of images uh, that exist. Um, I, I think, you know, interestingly enough, if you look at um, the depiction of, of Native Americans in Peter Pan, which is um, by far not a very generous <laughs> depiction, that their skin is extremely red and um, they, they speak in very stereotyped uh, sort of ways. Um, but, I mean, if you, if you look at that story... Um, it's a, a good example of, of this kind of contrast between, um, on one end, the, the savage um, that needs to be tamed, and on the other end, the, the, the savage, right, that is uh, noble in, in some sort of way. Um, and so, um, you know, thinking about this, um, this is the reason why, um, aside from saying that the red skin is one of the kind of worst stereotypes um, in, in existence, this is also one of the reasons why people have such, such, such a problem with using Native American heritage as a, as a type of mascot, um, is because um, not, not only um, does it, in a lot of ways, defame the kind of uh, real history and heritage behind Native Americans, um, it also is just trying to turn it um, into this this profit making sort of like a business that completely disregards the, the customs and traditions um, of, of those people. And, and again, looking at them f from the standpoint of Marx, right, really the, the most valuable thing in a capitalist society about Native American history is that it can be turned into a, a profit um, for people who are not <laughs> Native Americans. Um, and again, this is <clears throat> why, uh, you know, she's takes aim at things like uh, the casinos and um, you know, other industries that are based off of Native American heritage. So uh, another way um, that this de deterritorialization um, happens is through um, the education that is actually given to Native Americans trying to change um, their own cultural conceptions. Um, and where she thinks this is really a, a major contrast is the description of uh, women who are, who are ministrating. Um, and I want to point out this passage from Leviticus um, because it's the one that she's referring to when, when she's talking about um, how the Christian 
Christian missionaries ultimately um, educate her about uh, what, what women are like. And so um, in it, if you see Leviticus 15, 19 through 20, um, it says, uh, when a woman has her regular flow of, of blood, the impurity of her monthly period will last seven days. Anyone who touches her will be unclean till evening. Anything she lies on during her period will be unclean. Anything she sits on will be unclean. Uh, there's a writer um, named Rachel Held Evans uh, who, who wrote a book called um, A Year of Biblical Womanhood, um, where she uh, uh, try to f for a whole year uh, follow all of the rules um, that are prescribed in in Leviticus. Um, and if um, you're you're interested in, in things like that, I, I definitely tell you to check out the book. Um, but she, uh, she, uh, she you know she leaves the house for seven days and um, like uh, you know digs this this uh, in, encampment where she's supposed to bury um, her um, uh, her blood. Um, and that's uh, a very different version than what Polygon Allen actually learns um, is is true of most Native American um, uh, traditions. And so look at the description that she gives here. She says, the Lakota say that ministrating women anywhere near a Yawapi man who is a special sort of psychic, spirit-empowered healer for a day or so before he is to do his ceremony will effectively disempower him. Many hold that we possess innately the blood-given power to kill with a glance, with a step, with a judicious mixing of ministral blood into somebody's soup. And just looking at the contrast between both of those ideas, um, I hope it's obvious that um, there is a major difference in how um, a woman's period is, is seen in, in both of these cultures. Um, you know, in other spots, she, she talks about how when she, uh, she's on her period, um, her mother says, you know, that, that that's not a reason for her to not be able to go swimming or go hiking um, or do any of the things that she wants to do. Um, and that, um, you know, in, in some ways there's this uh, kind of uh, <laughs> a spite that her mother has uh, for uh, women who sit around and get the blues and get, get the cramps. Um, and uh, what I think is interesting about that is, is, is it still shows that, that perhaps some of the cultural narrative um, uh, surrounding a period is, is still um, that those, those things are accepted, um, right? But that her, her mother specifically take, takes issue with those exceptions. Um, but e either way, um, the idea that the woman is unclean or filthy or, or dirty, like during this time period, which is um, a, a reconstruction in lots of different um, uh, 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 Western conceptions of, of the period. Um, I, I'm thinking even of um, in uh, Ayan Hirsi Ali's book, Infidel, um, you know, she, she talks about how she, she's beaten um, regularly uh, once she starts having her period um, because it's seen as, as this uncleanliness uh, like from her. This conception in, in the Western world doesn't make its way into Native American literature. If you look at this picture on, on the left hand side, um, it's a story of uh, one of the uh, stories about how um, the, the earth was created, and this one's called The Woman Who Fell From the Sky. Um, and it's, it's about this woman who, who is pregnant um, and is um, either kicked out of heaven or falls out of heaven, uh, depending on which like version like you look at. Um, and she falls into the sea and is saved by this turtle. And from that, uh, you know, her, her children spring forth um, and all of life um, starts, starts to flow uh, from that. And um, the reason why I, I want to mention that in connection with this story is, is again, um, because of, of the place of women and the sacredness of life that is connected with it, um, which is very different um, than the Abrahamic version that you see um, in Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Um, but, but even further than that, um, di different than most religions that we see as this special veneration for women and the place that they have in the world. I want to end this discussion uh, really by thinking about another kind of conception that we have in, in the West. Um, and so um, 
it's a focus on on this word um, illegitimate and um, that there's other words that we, we have uh, for children uh, that, that fall in this category like a love child on the the happier kind of version um, you know Jon Snow if you ever read Game of Thrones is referred to um, continuously throughout the books as the bastard child um, and even um, as a legal designation we came up with this this uh, phrase Terra Nullis um, which means um, you know the child of nobody um, and when we think about it for a moment, um, there is a very specific reason why in Western uh, culture um, our lineage is traced paternally um, rather than maternally. Um, if, if you think about this for a second, it makes a lot more sense to trace someone's lineage through their mother because there's absolutely no doubt about who a person's mother is. Um, and in fact, um, if if you think about it for a second, um, you know you may or may not know who the father is, but you, you always know, right? Um, which person uh, is giving birth to a child? That's not in question whatsoever. Um, and yet, when we look at things like land ownership rights, property rights, um, even today when people um you know file for divorce in order for a woman to change her married name back to um her her regular maiden name um or for her to adopt a, another name uh, she has to go to the place where her uh original <laughs> um marriage certificate is she can't go to the county courthouse and get a copy uh, and bring it back um and there, there's all these different ways in which we re-victimize women um and um uh, make it almost impossible for women who are in abusive um, domestic violence sort of situations uh, to, to be able to, to get out of those safely. Um, and if we think about for a moment the notion of legitimacy, uh, Polygon Allen just thinks this is absolutely ridiculous. She thinks every life um, is legitimate. She thinks that Again, going back to her earlier statement, all, all of life is this is this great circle, um, is this sacred hoop, um, which is where the the title of the, of the book comes from, um, and and because of that, um, you know, we shouldn't see, um, we shouldn't divide people out uh, under these notions of legitimacy, um, but of course. One of the major constructions about a patriarchal society is that we will create hierarchies that allow men uh, to elevate themselves above women. And so even though women bear the responsibility for child labor, um, even though they're the ones who have to suffer uh, through all, all of the pain of bringing forth a new generation of people into the earth, um, we still, for whatever reason, uh, accept that uh, the paternal rather than the maternal lineage is the legitimate lineage. And um, I, I think this is just a, a, a very weird way in the West uh, by which right, we try to legitimize uh, children themselves. And so she says this. She, uh, she says, no child is ever considered illegitimate among the in Indians, they said. If a girl gets pregnant, the baby is still part of the family and the mother is too. I mean, actually, what you see is this is uh, in some ways kind of the softest version um, that she's talking about. Um, you, you see in um, many uh, Native American cultures um, where, where there is uh, very much this idea of, of an open uh, like sort of uh, marriage um, where um, sexual practices um, between uh, partners um, is a lot more open and, and marriage means something different than that the husband has ownership um, over his wife. And um, even in what would maybe be considered a more scandalous uh, kind of relationship, the children that are born from that um, aren't considered to belong to one father um, or to like one person, but but instead um, it's it's part of a family. And uh, in all honesty, um, it extends even further than that. It's it's part of a a larger tribe uh, of people. And so there are consequences for this type of thinking as well. If I can uh, show you the next slide for just a moment here. Paula Gunn Allen makes this statement. 
She says, of course, the ravages of colonization have taken their toll. There are orphans in Indian country now and abandoned, brutalized folks. There are even illegitimate children, though the very concept still strikes me as absurd. Proximity to the civilizing effects of white Christians has not improved the moral quality of life in Indian country. And so the whole point that she's really getting at throughout this whole essay is that, again, Western conceptions of what Native Americans are supposed to be change the actual status of Native Americans. Um, and in particular, uh, the conception that women have of themselves um, in Native American traditions are very different than the conceptions um, that women have uh, of themselves in, in Western society. And so, again, to her, the idea isn't, well, we should reclaim um, this kind of uh, authority um, that that like we should have um, and instead for her it's like we should reclaim our tradition because our, our tradition um, already makes room right for the equality of women um, you know women are warriors in Native American societies women have seats at the council meetings women are medicine women um, you know women are healers um, in her society uh, women are free to explore their sexuality um, women um, can be defined but by, by more than just their ability to cook and clean their ability to raise children um, and in some ways these uh, sorts of uh, ideas that we think of as uh, obligatory towards women's roles um, aren't, aren't even second nature in Native American cultures um, men can do them just as easily as, as women can and what she points out is that um, as Native American cultures are um, colonized um, um, as they are forced to go through these uh, Christian education uh, training camps, um, as they, they are forced in some ways to integrate themselves in with society, um, what ultimately happens is that uh, they, they lose their sense of heritage. They lose their sense of equality. Um, and they, they are forced to, to live um, counter to, to their own traditions. Um, and so for, for her, it, it's the project of, of feminism is much more about remembering who you are to begin with, remembering what it means to belong to your tribe, remembering the ideals, not not as they are shaped right by a Christian culture, um, but as, as they originally used to be. And um, she points out that in, in doing Doing that and, and thinking about um, your culture as it originally was, um, you will get a sense of equality restored uh, to women, and it will be restored in a way that it, that is very different than in the context of Western society. Because again, from her standpoint, there's no question in Western society um, that that men have a patriarchal notion of of entitlement. There's no question that in Western society, uh, women have to fight uh, for, for their rights and that, that in order to gain a sense of freedom, um, they have to deal with these, these forms of sexism. Um, but from Paula Gunn Allen's standpoint, Native American women, um, you know, originally did not have to deal with these these same issues, these same effects, until a Christian society showed up and, and told um, the people, um, forced the people in, in her culture to become just like them. And so she ends this essay by saying one thing that I think is just really interesting. Um, she says, one day the woman who thinks will speak to us again and everywhere there will be peace. And uh, one of the other kind of resonating themes throughout this essay, as she's talking about the, the different uh, women in um, Native American culture that have been influence, influential, um, is again, this idea about the thought woman. And uh, Grandmother Spider, as I mentioned, is um, you know seen as this this wise uh, individual that that weaves the universe together, and this description um, of of saying that the the woman who thinks will speak to us again um, could refer to, to Grandmother Spider, but at large um, it could refer to almost any of the women that we've really looked at um, in a Native American culture. I mean, everyone from uh, the the vision that Juan Diego has. Um, all the way over to you know Yataku, um, all of these different 
uh, women are are known um, not just for the gifts that they bring and for uh, the circle of life uh, that they help uh, you know complete in some ways, um, but they're known for their ability to sit back and think. Um, and this was true of Paula Gunn Allen throughout her life uh, as well. Is that you know she was known as, as as a thoughtful individual in terms of what her culture was. As as I mentioned um, earlier in our uh, fairness discussion, she's one of the first people uh, to really bring out this criticism about Western culture and, and to say, you know, um, it's lied about uh, the role of of women in Native American cultures. Why wouldn't it lie about the role of regular women, right, in in Western culture um and um her her criticism and and her ability to to do um this this heavy scholarship uh to really uncover uh, you know what, what are the lies that have been told um about history what are the lies that have been told about women um really lead to um <laughs> some interesting new discoveries um Maybe one of the most interesting kind of arguments um, that we won't really take a look at in, in feminism, um, but but finds its way in in this uh, discussion about indigenous feminism, um, is an argument uh, about the Venus statues. And if you don't know what these are, they're they're the oldest statues that um, have have been discovered um, throughout the world. Uh, we we find them, and and they're they're little small pocket sized kind of statues. They usually have very big breasts um, on. Uh, women um, and there's lots of different portrayals of them um, they're, they're called the Venus statues just because we, we find them spread throughout the world and um, uh, scholars conjecture all kinds of ideas about um, why we find them everywhere we, we found them uh, in places as remote as Siberia um, and you know as, as common as, as France and Spain and uh, uh, literally every place that there has been a uh, human civilization we, we have found some type of, of, of Venus statue you um and um and and like i said they're, they're the oldest relics um of human civilization and some feminist uh scholars particularly um those who look at indigenous um, feminist arguments um uh, make the argument uh that that perhaps uh, society um, before it was uh, a written culture was an oral culture and that when society was an oral culture um, it was a much more matriarchal uh, kind of culture now, that's not to say it was a full-on matriarchy <laughs> um, but that um, the role of women um, what was a lot more um, even um, than it was towards men um, and as the agricultural revolution took place um, and as um, uh, the uh, uh, oral tradition began to be replaced by a written tradition. A, a new form of power uh, took over that that replaced um, the the role that women had and and made uh, the, these patriarchal kind of constructions in society uh, more dominant. Um, th there's lots of reasons why you could could argue with that position i'm by no means saying that that is um the, the main position that that is held um by feminist scholarship um but what's interesting is that when indigenous feminism uh started to, to become a uh more popular form of uh, scholarship um th this was one of the ideas um that that came about from it so i've enjoyed this discussion i hope you have as well um, thanks for tuning in, and I, if you have any questions for me, feel free to email me. Have a wonderful day.